Welcome back 2021ers. This will be our penultimate lecture and which we begin our discussion of ELF files and the linking process. Before we begin a few logistics items, this material will be drawn primarily out of Bryant and O'Halloran uh, chapter 7, which discusses linking in quite a bit of detail. It is not necessary to study all of this and hopefully it will make apparent what I think are the most important points uh, to come out of this. Our goals today are to broach this subject and talk about this notion of separate compilation uh, and the process that the compiler goes through the late phase to stitch multiple compiled entities in this ELF file format into a single executable or library and some of the dynamic linking facilities that exist through the virtual memory system on modern systems. I also want to remind you quickly, and I'll do so now, uh, that the formal evaluations for our course are available on the university website, this SRT, Student uh, Review or Student Report on Teaching, I, I can't remember exactly what the acronym is, uh, but it has something to do with the color blue. Click the link, find all of the courses that you're enrolled in, and do fill out a formal eval on them. We will very likely in this course also have another feedback survey specifically targeted at topics and policies within this course, which will give you an opportunity to comment in some more detail on what we did in here. The formal evaluations are due on Monday, the 4th of May, that's the last day of classes, and the submission for those will close then. Our informal survey will probably be somewhat longer than that, and it'll probably be worth an engagement point to you uh, in order to fill out. Just so that you're aware of the end game, we're looking here at the, uh, actually, I think I have the date run here. This should actually be May 1st uh, for the last Friday lecture here, our first on object and uh, object code and linking. Uh, our last discussion will be on the 4th of May, and your project is due on Wednesday next week. It's uh, very likely that I'll have some extra office hours in the interest, uh, interstice uh, somewhere in here to aid you as you're working through that. And a week after Project 5 is due, we'll have our merged final exam, 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. Anyone who is in the morning class who is able to, I ask that you do uh, make plans to take the final exam then. If you have an unavoidable conflict, such as another final exam or other commitments, do email me and we could potentially make some arrangements for you to take the final exam at a different time. Let us begin this discussion of the ELF file format with the primary motivation for it. We have been compiling code throughout this uh, class, and generally as you'd go out there, compiled programming languages have this feature that you could, in many cases, compile everything in a single invocation of a compiler, such as this compilation two down here. As you would do so, you'd have, for instance, a main function and a main func.c, and maybe some support or helper functions in func01.c. And the particular command line that we're looking at here, GCC, puts all of those C files into the compiler and outputs eventually a program named mainfunk. An alternative mechanism that you'll have noticed we use at times in the class, and the times there uh, will be of interest, uh, is you can actually ask the compiler to compile individual files. It is func01.c, uh, the mainfunk.c, and you'll need to, in order to do so, uh, pass this little dash c option here, and we'll want to talk about the meaning of that shortly. And then after those uh, sort of preliminary compilations finish uh, to produce the main program here by passing in something called a main funk.o and a func01.0. It's worthwhile at this point to talk about what the difference is, is between those two compilation models. And in particular, can you spot any obvious artifacts that are created in the one but not in the other? We generally want to understand what the advantages and disadvantages of compiling according to these two paradigms are, uh, and then talk about which you should use in practice. Take a moment, experiment if you need to, I'll fire up a shell and compile a few things to see what happens, and comment on this. That should be long enough for those interested in pausing to do so. Here are my basic answers. This first mode of compilation up here I'll generally refer to as separate compilation. 
on, I see a typo that'll fix uh, shortly, uh, that this gcc-c up here should really be uh, with a dash c dot c file. I just failed to copy correctly down there. At any rate, uh, the point of this dash c option is to ask gcc, please compile this individual file. And it generally produces a dot o or object file after that. This object file is in the elf or executable and linkable format, and it's something that we'll discuss in some more detail later on. So this separate compilation goes through some steps to produce uh, .o files first before taking those .os and in a process known as linking, merges them together uh, to form the actual executable. Now it's the case that compilation two does not produce those .o files. Uh, it has to in a form, but tends to, as it would compile each of these files individually, produce the .os in a temporary location, such as the slash temp directory, we'll give them some arbitrary name, and then soon after creating them and merging them into main.func, uh, delete them. So left over in the compilation directory here, uh, there are usually not any .o files using this second compilation. How, why would you, you would do one versus the other is the next thing uh, we'd address. And the first and most obvious advantage to compilation two is that it's somewhat less typing on your part. Uh, many of you may have learned that if you do a GCC name and output program, or even don't bother to use the default a.out and just say star.c, all of the C files that are in the current directory will be compiled together, merged into an executable, uh, saving you some typing. So why on earth would you ever want to do something along these lines to separately compile each file uh, and then manually um, call the compiler uh, to not compile anymore, but to actually invoke the late stage linker uh, to merge them together. So uh, here is one motivation for such a thing. Uh, here is an individual named Mac, and he's building a large application. I picked easy names for the source files here, so you can forgive me if you, if you would. Uh, but this application is primarily comprised of a main function along with 20 odd C files uh, using this numbering scheme uh, just for ease of uh, nomenclature. During his compilation process, uh, Mac notices that it takes about 10 seconds for each C file to compile and about 20 seconds to perform this linking action, as in once these have been converted to .o files, uh, they can be squeezed together uh, by the linker uh, to produce the actual executable. Uh, and Mac is actively developing this thing and his, he's editing uh, his files, he tends to invoke the compiler as follows. Uh, output this as a program called mainfunk and just compile all the C files in this directory, something we alluded to before. It shouldn't take you too long to estimate how long his typical build is going to be according to this paradigm. And it should be obvious at this point that there might be a way to speed this thing up. Take a second, do a quick arithmetic calculation, and get back to me. All right, those of you who wanted to take a moment uh, should have just used a counting approach that there are 20 C files here. If each of them takes 10 seconds, then that is 200 seconds. Add on to that the final C file, the main func.c. Uh, that is 21 files then in total, 210 seconds, uh, plus 20 seconds extra to merge all of the resulting .os into an executable. That's 230 seconds or four. So uh, that's almost four minutes of time that every time Mac makes a change to his code, he needs to recompile all of these things. Uh, this will create temporary .os that are usually in a temporary address directory, uh, and then eventually produce the uh, executable. This is potentially a waste of valuable human time. Uh, certainly, it's easier to type this uh, than it would be otherwise. Uh, but it also means that Mac is going to do a lot of sitting around as he makes a change to a single C source file and then recompiles everything. Uh, this may eat away at his productivity, more or less. So a standard way uh, to narrow down the amount of time it takes to compile is selectively recompile. If Mac edits some feature that's in this function 08.c file, it's not worth his while to recompile all of the C source files. But instead, if he's compiled each of them individually to produce a more or less permanent uh, .o file, for instance, func 01.0, func 02.0, and so on, and he edits only one of the C source files, there are no changes in func01.0 and func02.0, so there's no point in recompiling them. 
Instead, you just recompile the single.c file. That'll take you probably uh, 10 seconds or so. Uh, and then re relink everything, as in all of the .o files need to be merged back in uh, uh, to produce the executable. The fact that you're not recompiling all C files then means you're limited to just this one .c file. So no need to recompile uh, any of the C files uh, that have been uh, already compiled. Uh, the .os already exist. Uh, just recompile the one that you want, uh, 10 seconds. Uh, relink takes 20 seconds and you're down from four minutes to about 30 seconds. Now this is pretty tedious because it requires Mac uh, not to sort of wait around anymore, but to mentally keep track of which source files have I actually touched and edited, something that we are notoriously bad at doing. And to that end, it would be well worth his while to automate this process somewhat. This is a well-recognized kind of problem, and so one would tend to write a make file at this point. The beauty of make files is that you write down a whole bunch of commands in them and the make program itself has automated detection of dependencies so that if a source file changes and a dot o file depends on that source file it'll be automatically recompiled and the executable will be automatically remerged here's a small example of a make file and I want to emphasize that I'm not going to examine you, for instance, in the final exam on your ability to understand or create make files. Instead, it's just a generally useful tool to have at your disposal. And it's an example of a build system. Uh, generally out there, there are lots of these. Uh, make is one of the oldest ones and its features are very prevalent elsewhere out there. It has a simple enough structure that it fits in a single slide. Each of the sort of segments that you see over here is essentially a target, as in something I want created, in this case an executable, and a set of dependencies to the right of it. Uh, these are things that I need to have created already before I could create this thing. If these things are present, then I'll run the following command or set of commands in order to take the dependencies and create the uh, target over here. And you can see that's done with the GCC invocation where my target over here appears as the program trying to produce, and each of the dependencies over here, they appear as uh, objects that I'm going to link together to create the program. Now what make does is to automatically detect that, oh, if these things are here, I'm going to run this command and produce this executable. But if this .o isn't there, or it appears that I need to recreate this .o because something else has changed, then I'll look through the rest of the targets down here. And as you would want to create this main func, uh, it would first examine, okay, this main func .o, is it around? Since main func .o depends on main funks.c, the make file will, or the make program will do an automatic dependency calculation to see uh, if this main funks.c has been recently updated, as in the last modification to it is uh, later than the last modification to this dot o, then someone has changed the source file, so I'll need to run this command uh, to update this dot o. That then in turn will trigger this main func to be rebuilt because one of the dot o's has, has changed that it depends on. So this gets the best of both worlds, and that's by simply by typing a command like make, you will run a dependency calculation to see have any source files changed, and if so, rebuild the application from scratch. Uh, this is why build systems are beautiful, is that you get the beauty of a short command to rebuild, and all the benefits in terms of performance of detecting and compiling only those things that need to be uh, recompiled based on changes to source files. It's good to have in any you know, medium to large scale project some sort of build system. Make is an oldie but a goodie, but others exist out there uh, that may be more centered on the particular programming environment that you're running in. Most compiled languages have something along these lines. And if you're working in something like Java, you may want to investigate not make, but Ant or Maven. If you're working in OCaml, I believe it comes bundled with an OCaml build, which I've never been able to understand. So still use make files, and so too I uh, use make files when working with Java. They're what I know, and uh, an old professor like me is just reluctant to learn new tricks when the old ones seem to work just fine thus far.
At any rate, uh, you should appreciate at least the fact that all of the make files that we've provided in the class have automated a lot of the process of building C programs. And that in most cases, all you need to do is type make or make test in order to build your entire application and run automated tests uh, and even create zip files from it. So this is not just good uh, for compiling stuff. It has other features uh, that you can build into it as well. Uh, so examples of that come uh, in the following. That is, you have uh, a big project. A standard target to provide is the clean, which will get rid of all the compiled stuff. And making the first time may take a while. Spend that four minutes to create all the little .o files from the .c files and then merge them. But if you edit only func08.c, type make again, then this is the only one that needs to be recompiled and then the linking process happens. Uh, this means uh, that you're good to go in a much shorter amount of time. And if after rebuilding like this, uh, you haven't edited anything and type uh, make again, then what you'll find is make says there's nothing to do. I've already created this make funk. You haven't changed anything. There's no need to rebuild anything at this point. Super slick. Mm -hmm. So then one would might wonder how it is that one can build sort of this partial executable business, these .o files. And to that end, we'll need to start having a look at the format that they occupy. It's a binary format and was established some 20 odd, 30 odd years ago, uh, the executable and linkable uh, file format uh, or ELF for short. Uh, this is divided into a bunch of sections and it reads something like a book uh, that at the top there's sort of a title page that comes in the form of a binary header. It's a struct in C and so as we are for instance in the last assignment mapping uh, using mmap this binary file you point a pointer at this beginning of the file you say pretend it's one of these elf header structs uh, and you can actually start accessing, accessing fields and so forth. Usually towards the end of the um, the elf file there is a table of contents that is present uh, that more or less tells you information about where the remaining sections are each of these have uh, some sort of a structure associated with it and some of them have names that might ring just a little bit familiar for instance we've been talking since an early point in the course about an area of memory known as the text section this is where your executable instructions are loaded into memory so they, they can be fed to the processor but it's the case that as you would compile something, you would need to convert from C, convert the C uh, into a data structure, the data structure into assembly, and the assembly eventually into binary opcodes. Those are saved on disk, and this is the section in L files where they're, where they're stored. So most of the .o files uh, that are present are not actually executable. Uh, they're instead object code, as it were. But they have a layout similar to this, that somewhere in there is a spot where the text associated with any functions that were present in the file are stored. And so if you were to run a compilation like this, uh, you'd expect probably in this main func.c there to be the, in the resultantly main func.o someplace there's a text section and in there are little opcodes that are associated with running the main function and whatever functions are in func01.c once it's compiled and a .o file is produced in the text section there might be a few of the support functions or at least their binary opcode versions of this the name says it all and that aside from executables like your standard a.out these .o files are linkable as well. And so this file format is designed to store text and other information in such a way that it can be either executed or merged with other ELF files uh, to create bigger ELF files or at least executable ELF files eventually. And this is the job of a late stage of compilation known as the linking. Uh, so we'll, uh, linking stage. Uh, this linking business then is part of the compilation chain that we'll need to talk about just a little bit uh, to understand what its intent is and the purpose, how it enables this separate compilation business and therefore time savings, uh, and also some of the problems that you can uh, sort of run into if you're not careful with this stuff. Minor historical aside, ELF is not the only executable format that was out there. It was actually preceded by an older format known as the A.out format. And to this day, GCC continues to produce executables with the default name A.out. They don't follow that historical format anymore, but it's a byproduct of the GCC writers uh, never updating that part of the code. 
Uh, to that end, we should talk maybe a little bit about some of the sections that are present in this ELF file uh, that in certain ways enable uh, this linking business and relate to other parts of the programs that we've talked about so far. So one tends to be able to tell uh, in the ELF header what architecture and formats the uh, executable that's uh, data that's present in the file was stored in. ELF is a fairly general format, so it is not tied directly to Intel architectures of any star sort. In fact, you can produce uh, ELF files that are associated with other processors, 32-bit uh, variants of the Intel family, uh, and even probably go back uh, to older variants uh, that are 8- and 16-bit formats associated with certain kinds of processors. Most most of the information about that type of stuff will be stored in the header in one shape or uh, way, shape, or form. Uh, it's our intent, though, in the project that we only deal with 64 bits uh, x86-64 stuff, uh, so you don't need to worry about anything aside from that. The rest of the sections uh, that are in here uh, are of some importance uh, to understand in terms of global stuff. Uh, we mentioned a moment ago that there is a section header table. Uh, usually this shows up at the end of the file, uh, but it's mentioned here as a sort of table of contents that describes in some way where the rest of the stuff is at. Tech section has opcodes for stuff. Uh, there are also a bunch of spots where various kinds of data are stored. Any global variables that your C files contain have to be written to disk in some way to apprise a program as it's loaded into memory. Uh, that, that global data should begin life as the program is being loaded and only be gotten rid of as the program closes down we'll find that this actually follows two formats. Uh, one is the initialized global variables that have values. And there's another section used for uninitialized global variables. There, if you didn't specify a value associated with the variable, then you will uh, get zeros in there in this um, BSS section. I used to, used to remember what that acronym was for, but can't anymore. An important part that you'll be working with in the project is the symbol table. And this generally gives a tab, table that describes all of the global stuff that is in your program or in the, uh, the ELF file. Uh, this includes global variables and any functions that are present, which are all referred to generally as symbols. Although the type of symbol, whether it's an object data or if it's a uh, function instead, uh, that is present as data that's in that symbol table. Uh, typically also the symbol table includes stuff about this is the section that this symbol is stored in, that this uh, thing is a global variable and so its value is actually stored in the data section versus the this other thing is a symbol that corresponds to a function that can be invoked and it's stored in the text section instead. Various parts of this file, uh, this ELF file, refer back to its other parts. Uh, so for instance, uh, there's usually a stir tab or string table in there. Uh, this contains names such as uh, the symbol table itself doesn't contain uh, names or anything. Instead, it refers into the string table uh, to indicate where various things are at. And so too, the section headers all have names like dot text and so forth. And they're stored in this sh stir tab uh, thing. So there's a lot of indirect here. The L file format itself is very clever in that it's of general purpose and just about everything in it is fixed size and yet it's still flexible enough to account for variable amounts of data in, in different forms. It's worth studying if you ever uh, have need to uh, create your own binary file formats as you might draw a lot of uh, experience from understanding it somewhat more deeply. You get a little taste of that as you have to parse it in your last project today. Uh, I think that's probably enough for the moment, except to mention these last couple sections down here. We won't go into any great detail about this debug section, but anytime you would compile something with the dash G option, there's some additional information that is stored in your dot O or A dot out executables, and it's usually put into this section. It has its own little mini format, uh, dwarf, uh, which gives you some sense that the uh, inventors of this file format may have been playing D&D &D on the weekends if they're calling their uh, file formats after mythical creatures like elves and dwarves and so forth. Uh, but we won't have any cause to get into the details of what that looks like. Suffice to say, it's what GDB and Valgrind and so forth would work with as they're trying to figure out, as they execute opcodes here, what parts of your code those correspond to and what variables are actually leading to out-of-bounds axes and so forth. 
Finally, then, a part of the uh, process of linking is uh, that as you would make use of a global variable in one C file that's actually defined in another file, uh, you may need to include some information about when this is linked, fill in a blank here uh, that wasn't available at this time. Uh, this relocation business is tied up with uh, something we observed early on when our work with assembly files where you have to do this rip relative addressing. Uh, and this section contains information on that part that we may or may not have time to get to by the end of our uh, lectures on linking. If we don't get that far, there is some information late in this slide deck about that for those who are curious. So ELF is a binary file format, and this makes it somewhat hard on the eyes. As you would look at one of these dot O's, uh, and what you're seeing here is a hexadecimal representation of what's in there, uh, you see almost no ASCII. Uh, all of the stuff that's up here is sort of non-printable in the ASCII range. As you work your way down here, you may actually find some stuff uh, that is associated with stringy kinds of things. And this is oftentimes stuff that is either strings that your program is going to print, or names of various sections, or some combination thereof. You can see here uh, that the sections are color coded. So the first few bytes in this uh, are the ELF file format. And one notable uh, bit of ASCII that's in there, the file uh, that dot O's and uh, A dot outs and so forth, uh, the format it comes in, starts with the so-called magic bytes. Uh, there's a particular uh, 7F here, that's always the beginning part. And then the ASCII codes for ELF. There are a lot of uh, file system utilities that can allow you to guess at the file format associated with stuff. And one of the common techniques when you have binary files uh, is to plop down some magic bytes at the beginning to help with this identification process. If it's not plain text, it's otherwise hard to sort this out. And you'll, in your program to parse ELF files, to fish out information from them, definitely be looking at these first few magic bytes so you can identify, oh, this is or is not an ELF file because there's no sense in proceeding if it's just a standard text file uh, as it won't file, follow the conventions uh, that are associated with it. So as uh, you would work your way through here, uh, the color coding here, uh, it shows in some ways what the uh, different section layouts are here. But since everything in here is variable sized, you would need to have some guidance, some documentation associated with this file in order to know how to proceed. Uh, to that end, make sure as you're working on this to follow very carefully the information that's provided in the specification and do some reading independently, uh, such as the manual pages on the ELF file format. So you know where to jump to uh, in this file in order to find, for instance, the section header. So you know where the text section starts and ends, know where the string table starts and ends and so forth. The first thing that we'll look at in terms of effects of C code on dot O's is the inclusion of global variables. This is a common example, and it won't take us too long to sort out, but I think it's a good uh, jumping off point as we relate C code to these dot O files. Now on the left hand side and the right hand side are two C programs that do more or less the same thing. They have a small array and they initiate, or sorry, a, a medium sized array, I should say, uh, and they will iterate through it, initializing the values to uh, the numbers 0 to 1024. Uh, this only accounts for part of the array, so we're not going through the entire thing. The only central difference between these two, uh, which should be obvious if uh, it hasn't jumped out yet already, is that over here in the big data.c version of this, will give some initial values uh, to the first three elements in this 20,000 element array. Uh, importantly, if you do not initialize more than that, then the remaining elements in the array are guaranteed to be initialized to zero. Though it's slightly non-standard syntax, you can initialize the entire array to be zeros just by putting an open and close parenthesis here as well. Some folks have told me that if you turn on enough sort of pedantic uh, warnings on GCC. It'll actually tell you this is not a well-supported or standards compliant syntax, but I haven't seen a compiler yet that will refute it and not compile in this one. But the meaning of this then is the first three elements, one, two, three, all elements zero, uh, elements after uh, one, two, three are zero over here. The big effect that you'd see if you look at this uh, as a compilation is present down here. If you take just a moment to examine this, 
what you'll see is that after compiling big data.c uh, and asking how many bytes is it using this handy disk utilization or disk usage utility and show me its quantity in bytes, uh, you'll see that it occupies a whopping 161,384 bytes versus the big BSS over here, it occupies only a paltry 1,384 bytes. The immediate question is why, if these programs are not that different, is there such a size difference between them? Now the answer lies in a convention associated with GCC and how it produces uh, these .o files. As you would compile this thing, GCC would see that part of the array is initialized. And to that end, the initial values that are stored in here must be stored in the compiled file that GCC produces. Versus, there's no initialization over here aside from all these things are zeros. To that end, GCC actually makes use of a trick and exploits the fact that there is this big uninitialized data section uh, that can be used in ELF that it guarantees that when you initialize or uh, load the program, that's any data in that section uh, is automatically set to be zeros. So if you look then at these two compiled artifacts, uh, what you'll see is the following. Uh, make use, for instance, of the read elf utility. Ask for the sizes and uh, section header listings associated with all this stuff. Uh, to do so then, uh, as you would run on this big data part, you'd see that it's data section, which contains initialized data. Uh, it starts here at this uh, 3, 2 uh, offset, or sorry, at this uh, offset of uh, 0080. These are in hexadecimal again, so uh, I'll be careful about to interpret it in that way. And that the next section that uh, appears in the L file directly after that is the BSS section, but there's nothing in there. The offsets then, the difference between where this section starts and its immediate process predecessor then gives the size of this data section. And lo and behold, you subtract off, you get in hexadecimal 27100, that's over here. You're forgiven if you cannot uh, do that in your head, uh, but in decimal, that's uh, 160,000 bytes. This should ring some bells because the array that we were establishing is an array of 20,000 elements, and it's of longs, which are 8 bytes long. This multiplied by the size of eight bytes gives you 160,000 160, bytes, which is exactly the size then of this data section. So essentially the compiler, because it was writing the one, two, three in there, also wrote a whole crap load of zeros after it, totaling uh, this 160,000 bytes uh, and occupying then this very large data section. If you notice then, the exact difference between the sizes of these two is 160,000 bytes. Uh, that here, 1,384, knock that off and you've got 160,000. Essentially, most of this uh, .o file is a big array full of mostly zeros. In contrast, uh, if you run read elf on this big BSS section, uh, because it was initialized all zeros, as in don't put any values in here, I'll make them zeros, uh, then what you'll see is that the data section is essentially empty. Starts at uh, over here offset uh, 7f, uh, but very shortly after that is this uh, BSS section, uh, 80. Uh, this long array in here is going to be put in there because it has no initialized data. And you can see this section uh, is followed at offset 80 immediately by the dot comment section. Don't need to know what that is, but do uh, recognize that, oh, there actually is no space that this BSS section is taking up. Nothing is stored there. And this explains entirely then uh, why this BSS version of the code, which has an all zeros array, is smaller on disk. So this is a sign then of some of the interactions between how things you would write in C in terms of both code and data may affect the sizes of the .o files that you produce from it. It also exploits one of the clever engineering tricks associated with uh, the ELF file format and that it has two different sections for different purposes. And if you uh, didn't have such a thing, then in either case, you'd have to store this very large array in here. It's commonly the case that you need some large global area, but it doesn't have any defined values in it at the start of execution. Uh, this allows then the BSS section to be utilized to save space. So it's time now to talk just a little bit about what the linking process looks like. Generally, the linker actually has a somewhat simple job. 
It has two .o files in the simplest case, and it needs to merge them into either a single .o or an executable. Generally, that means then any code that is in the two .o files, uh, you have uh, text for .o1 and text for .o2, and the output .o3, you have to take the text from all both those one and twos, uh, glom them together, and plop them down in .o3. Similarly so for the data section, and similarly so for the symbol table and all the other sections that are present there. Uh, importantly, uh, as you would make those changes, uh, the section associated with one of these .o files uh, might indicate, oh, my function a, it starts at the beginning. Uh, and the other .o might have function b, uh, which is the only function in there, uh, and it has a function that starts at the beginning of its text section. But as you merge those two together, either a or b has to come first in the resulting singular .o. And so you have to make adjustments in other parts of the table of contents and the symbol table and so forth to account for the fact that one of these .o all of its stuff is going to appear after the other one. This also means, though, then that you can start to declare that in .01, I'm going to use a function called function b. Uh, and that function b comes from the second .o file, uh, where the definition for function b is present. Anybody who's coded and has never not written a definition for what printf does but is exploited using it uh, is familiar with this phenomenon and how useful it is to not have to define in a single C file every function you're ever going to use. But this symbol resolution business can actually lead to some tricky bugs uh, that we'll hopefully get to in just a few moments. Finally then, uh, as you would need to sort of compile the first dot O, which has a function A, and that function A is going to use function B that's defined elsewhere, then you need to make sure to include some information about I need a function B, and I don't know where it is right now, so insert some blanks right here. Uh, and at the point that you're merging, uh, you need to be able to have that relocation data to jump to that spot and patch it with where B is going to be in the merged executable. So linkers are, you know, have a fairly simple purpose. They're a glorified sort of merge and match uh, kind of function, but it's a very important uh, purpose and uh, important task, and it uh, has a lot of details associated with it. We'll only touch on a few of these as we move forwards, uh, but without a linker, you would be forced to compile all of your C code in wealth one fell swoop, and we've already seen that this is untenable. It would also preclude the use of any sorts of libraries that are either statically or dynamically linked. Uh, and that you have to have access to source code only. So the ability to separately compile then is very much enabled by this linker business. To demonstrate this principle at its sort of simplest, uh, I think it's worthwhile to look at a little example in which we take 2.0 files and merge them together using manual linker invocations. You almost never do this in practice, that instead you'll do this through um, GCC. But to prove the presence of such uh, um, uh, tools out there, I think it's worth looking at. Uh, in the example that's over here on the right, I have compiled a func01.c. It has a single function in it called func01. And the resulting .o then, if you ask what names are present in here, uh, another way of sort of asking about a symbol table and so forth, uh, then and you'll see that there's a func01 in the text section. Uh, and there's also an undefined function called put s in here. Uh, this is generally what standard print strings or printfs get translated to if they don't have any format specifiers in them. Similarly, down here, I have a func 02o that was compiled from some C source file. It has a func 02, uh, the function in it that's in its text section, and similarly use some printf in there. You can manually then run the linker, a program called LD, uh, and through the right set of options here, uh, ask it to explicitly merge this .o and this .o into a single .o uh, that's out there elsewhere. And the resulting .o that's created is specified with this dash o option. Uh, if you ask then after running this command uh, to show me what's uh, in this combined funks 12o file, then you'll see that it now contains uh, funks 01 and funks 02. 
Initially, this Funk01 was at the zeroth position and it still is in the merged version. Uh, but Funk02, which was at the zeroth position in the text section, uh, it's now some distance farther along in the text section because it appears in the merge section after Funk01. Apparently, Funk01 takes up 13 bytes. The opcodes for it are that long. And that leaves then Funk02 somewhat farther along in this. That simple process then, uh, you can imagine hopefully uh, that for any number of functions between uh, the first dot O and the second dot O, you could pull this off. And for any number of dot O's that you're merging simultaneously, uh, this sort of merging activity could also be pulled off. Uh, generally, it's a little bit uh, tedious to invoke the linker in order to produce executables. Uh, so, for instance, uh, if you were trying to uh, produce uh, from these two dot O's an executable, uh, then since they don't contain a main or a start for the standard C library, then you get all kinds of uh, errors on this. Uh, invoking the linker then indirectly through GCC is well worth your while uh, instead, just as it was the case when we were trying to assemble code. Uh, and, and rather than invoking the GAS assembler by hand, you just call GCC on stuff. You tend to say GCC with these dot O's uh, to produce uh, some executable eventually. One of the jobs that the linker has to do is to resolve symbols. Uh, so to uh, put that sort of mildly, it's like here's a uh, func01, it's using a uh, func02 um, uh, function within it, uh, but that is not specified there. So uh, one must then, uh, when you're producing a merge sort of executable, decide do I have a func02 uh, to add into this thing so I can patch uh, the first function after that. Now this usually doesn't result in many problems with functions because you either have them or you don't. But where you can get into trouble uh, is in the resolution of symbols associated with variables. ELF files define this notion of strong and weak variables, or strong and weak symbols rather. Uh, and it tends to be difficult to have uh, sort of a, a conflicting mixture of these associated with functions. You either have a strong definition for a function or uh, no definition at all on that front. But uh, symbols associated with variables uh, can be somewhat sort of more strong or weak. Uh, the general rule is as follows. Uh, strong definitions are mostly name functions and global variables uh, that have been initialized to stuff. Weak definitions, on their hand, uh, mostly are comprised with uninitialized global variables, uh, typically because they're declared as external, uh, or function prototypes, as in here, I promise I'll deliver this function, uh, but I'm going to put it instead of an opening curly, a semicolon to state that it's going to be there, I promise. We'll see now an example of where this goes sideways associated with uh, a conflicting strong and weak definition. So over here on the left is an xint.c uh, file. And what you'll see in here is a definition for x as an integer that has a value of 0, and immediately adjacent to it, an integer y that is initialized to 0. Both of these are strong definitions in the ELF uh, system uh, in that they have a declaration for the variable and a well-defined value that's assigned to it. Never mind the fact that it's assigned to zero, uh, but uh, this won't matter in terms of the strength of that definition. We have a weak definition for a function uh, here, uh, x to neg eight, uh, but there's not really much to this function. It takes no arguments and uh, returns nothing. And then finally, I have a strong definition for main down here in which this x to neg 8 is uh, called. Then we print out the value uh, for x and for y before returning. Uh, if this x to neg 8 doesn't do anything, you expect 0 to be printed for both x and y over here. But you can see uh, this example is constructed expressly to do something like that. Up top, in order for this uh, x to neg egg function to work, uh, it must have the notion of a global variable uh, of x. And so up here is declared that global variable in this uh, uh, file. Uh, the interesting thing about it is that it's declared as a long, but not given an initial value. Uh, so this is where we're going to see potential problems come in. All the function does is to assign the value to uh, minus 8 to x. And uh, that being called over here in the main, when you compile these together, uh, you would want to predict what value is going to come out for x and potentially for y down here. Take a moment and think about this. And also, as usual, think about why I'd be asking about this. 
Uh, it is the case that as you compile these two, the linker warns you that something uh, is up. And we'll have a look at the form that that warning takes momentarily. All right, so this will close our, our discussion because it apprises you to one of the standard problems that can arise in linking if you're not careful. You have these two files, and the second file, the xlong, actually has a, a weak definition for what x is it, because it's uninitialized, versus the xint uh, has an initialized value for x as zero. And so the linker will actually issue a warning saying there's actually a duplicate definition here that this x thing, uh, it appears twice. And uh, very importantly, uh, it is not the case that these two uh, definitions for X are in correspondence to each other. Uh, the one that I'm gonna use has a, a size of eight, as in X is a four byte integer. But there is this other one over here uh, that is coming from another .o or .c file. And this one says it's eight bytes big. But I'm going to favor this uh, stronger definition, x, uh, despite the warning. And this leads to very interesting output. Uh, minus 8 for x, which is more or less expected, but minus 1 for y. Now, if they double, do a double take there, I mean, look back and see, here I've declared x is 0, y is 0. In this function that I run, it changes x to minus 8. Then I print these two out. How in God's name could you have a value other than 0 for x? Uh, for, for y, uh, that the minus 8 for x is fully expected, but we should see seeing a 0 for y. Some of you who had trouble with uh, assembly in various ways will understand why this is happening. When you compile this right-hand function, it has to issue some assembly instructions in this function that change a global spot in memory. And according to this definition for x, it's an 8-byte quantity. So the assembly stream down here will be associated with an 8-byte move queue, uh, which will move the binary representation from minus 8 to wherever x is. However, when we merge these two files together, the actual data location associated with x is only 4 bytes big. And so 8 bytes are written there by when you call this function. But since only 4 bytes are associated with x, uh, that area gets overwritten uh, and writes off into other parts of memory. Lo and behold, very near to this, packed tightly will be four bytes associated with Y. Finally then, uh, as you would wonder, well, what is it that's getting rid of that spot? Is it garbage stuff? Recall that all negative numbers in two's complement uh, are preceded by a long sequence of ones. Uh, so you have a leading one followed by a whole bunch of other ones. So the four bytes for y, since minus a is a relatively small negative integer, uh, the four bytes of y are gonna have all ones in them. And as you would print it out down here, the uh, decimal number that's associated with all ones in two's complement is minus one. Thus you see down here, uh, minus one. Now it's worthwhile just to take a moment and appreciate, man, that example here just tied it together like 60 percent of the stuff that we have learned in this class uh, we've learned something about c syntax we learned something about the assembly level versions of things uh, about the memory layout of programs and about the binary representation of integers and you need all of those things to understand why there is a minus one here instead tricky made of business here uh, but not something that would be out of the question in terms of exam problems of why is this weird behavior happening speculate at least on that part so uh, message here is that global variables have some dangers associated with them particularly in linking uh, in code design in general uh, it's best to avoid global variables where possible don't take this to the extreme. Sometimes a global variable is just right to fix certain problems, uh, but be forewarned that it may induce other difficulties either later on or immediately. Uh, for the moment, we'd like to resolve uh, this to say, how could I prevent such disasters from happening? Uh, well, first and foremost, never ignore warnings, particularly from the linker, uh, that this is an important bit of information that's uh, apprising you the fact that something dangerous is potentially happening with the code that's going to be produced. Don't trust that, investigate it, resolve it so that your code compiles without such warnings. Generally, you can make your life easier through the use of header files. This is a type of file that's associated with C programming that's designed uh, to make aware all other C code of the conventions that will be used for things like function prototypes uh, and global variables. 
So typically to solve this kind of a problem, if you had two files like this, you would establish a unified header, uh, for instance, x to neg 8.h, and it would declare unequivocally, there is going to be out there this long uh, named x. The x term here says that uh, as folks include this dot h, they don't actually declare uh, that the x you're looking for is here, but instead that I promise that it's gonna be out there someplace. What that's going to do then uh, is in sort of a normal system, you pound and include that in here. In the file that's associated with uh, this actual long x, uh, you declare it, uh, so this makes it real. And then when you would compile the dot o or this uh, x to net 8 uh, uh, dot c file, uh, then you would have an object with eight bytes of space allocated in the dot o associated with it. Uh, in the main file uh, down here, uh, you would pound include uh, this thing and probably not redeclare any global variables along those lines, uh, and this would prevent any harm from coming. If you inadvertently did uh, declare something about, oh, here's an X and it's an integer instead in the global scope, when you compiled due to the inclusion of this header file, uh, then you would get an immediate compiler warning uh, or error uh, indicating that, whoa, 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 you have declared in this um, you know, xbanebad.c file that there is an integer called uh, x and it is an integer uh, and that conflicts directly with uh, a previous declaration that came from your header here. Now, I'm not going to move forward at all to produce any sort of compiled artifact until you resolve this conflict. Earlier warnings on this front are much better. And it's best then to move that stuff as far forward as possible. Certainly uh, compilation errors are preferable to linker warnings and linker warnings are preferable to runtime weirdness and errors like this, uh, which is terribly hard to, hard to sort out. Uh, so uh, at all times, be cognizant of that and make sure to use headers appropriately. And if you don't know how, practice just a bit. Uh, and resolve any sorts of compilation warnings or errors prior to moving forwards. So we will end today just with a quick discussion of this immense journey that you go on to get programs to go from source code to become actual running entities. This is something that's preoccupied us through various parts of the class, but is good to summarize at this point. There is this entity known as the compiler, uh, and we bow before its might as it converts our C programs uh, into various lower levels. Uh, it tends to uh, convert your C program initially into some sort of an internal data structure representation, and we've seen at various points that it can optimize the crap out of that stuff to produce much faster code uh, based in, on even sort of the worst kinds of C code written. It will then produce some assembly code, uh, and we've seen that you can stop this phase uh, with the dash s option so that it spits out some dot s files, which are human readable, <laughs> air quotes on human readable, but human readable text version of that uh, assembly code. Typically then the compiler invokes some friends and family there. Uh, in the next step after it has uh, some textual version of the assembly, it will invoke the assembler, uh, GAS or GNU assembler in this case, uh, to convert uh, its .s uh, internal stuff uh, into a actual .o, uh, this ELF file format. There may be multiple .os involved, uh, but eventually uh, those .os uh, have to be linked together to produce an executable for, um, for program. The linker, this uh, third sort of program in that part, uh, LD, is responsible for merging .os, determining any additional uh, external libraries that need, for instance, where printf is located, uh, and will either statically or dynamically link uh, to those, something we'll talk about in our next lecture. The results of these first three steps then are a so-called stored program. Uh, you have an a dot out, or if you called it something with the dash o option to GCC, it's a prog dot out. Generally in the ELF file format on most Unix systems, although there are other alternatives, uh, Windows and Mac uh, have their own executable formats uh, there. So this program just sits there on disk until you actually want to run it. And then two other entities come into play that are very important. LD Linux.so on most Linux systems is the so-called loader program. It's designed to pick up this static prog.out that's sitting on disk and make it alive. To do so, it has to parse this ELF file format and figure out where is your global data, uh, where is your text section. I need to load those to some spots in the virtual memory image associated with this program. 
And now I need to probably memory map some space into your image to give you a heap so that mal can do its business and memory map some additional image toward the high address range uh, to give you a stack. Uh, I will start running your stuff by plopping down a few functions that set up main and then call your main so you can get going. Uh, this loader in the process will initialize all the global data that is in that data section by writing it into main memory, memory mapping someplace. It will uh, initialize the BSS section to all zeros. It will resolve any dynamic links, uh, for instance, by connecting through memory maps your program to standard libraries like libc. Finally sets the instruction pointer in the processor register, and this puppy is ready to go. At that point, it becomes a running process and the operating system handles the uh, in-memory image of the program, which is now completely separated from this original uh, disk file that's still sitting there statically. Copies of this stuff uh, then get moved into RAM, become running programs, and are subject to the operating system scheduler to run, get put on pause for some other program to get its turn, run again, uh, eventually uh, produce some sort of outputs through IO routines, maybe go to sleep, wake up, go out of bounds, get killed, finish normally, etc., etc. Those later kinds of things are parts that we've alluded to just a little bit, but will be studied in some more detail as you would take an operating systems course like 4061. We'll end that immense journey here. And if folks are looking for some of reading, uh, this immense journey is an allusion to an interesting book by the naturalist Lauren Isley uh, that talks about the immense journey of life, a series of very good essays that might be good to reflect on uh, these days. For the moment, that's uh, as, much, as much immenseness as I can tolerate this evening, uh, and we'll pick up next time discussing some more about linking and the library system. Hope everyone is happy and healthy. Until I see you again, keep hacking at it.